Hi class, today we're beginning section 1.5, Differentiation Techniques, and we're going to be going over the power rule and the sum and difference rules. And so as we find the derivative or we differentiate using these two rules, uh, we'll find that it, using the pattern is going to be a lot easier than finding the limit of the difference quotient each time we need to find a derivative. Um, we also have a rule to help us differentiate a constant and a constant times a function. We'll be practicing all of those today in this section, as well as determining points at which the tangent line has a specified slope. And if you recall, the tangent line has a slope the same as the derivative at that point. So let's get started. As you recall, last section, we found the limit of the difference quotient as h approaches zero, and we called that the derivative or f prime of x. We now also say that can be read as y prime, written y with an apostrophe. The y prime is also the same thing as f prime of x. And there's other ways to write the derivative. Another common way is to write the derivative of y with respect to x. And this is written as the derivative of y with respect to x, dy dx. This is called Leibniz notation named after the mathematician Gottfried von Leibniz. You can refer to this dy dx as the change in y over the change in x. And the d would maybe be like the difference in y and over the difference in x. Notice that um, you can say y prime is the derivative, f prime of x is the derivative, dy dx is the derivative, or you would read this last notation as d dx of f of x, or df dx. So those are four different ways that we can say that we're finding the derivative. Um, notice that if you put a function over here, this acts as a command operator, and that tells you find the derivative of this function here. The first example just talks about notation. So we have a function g, which is defined as h of x. x is the variable inside the function. h is the name of the function. It's also named g. So we have multiple names of it. One thing that we can do is always use the prime notation. That would be g prime or h prime of x. So those are two of the ways that we can represent the derivative. The other two ways are using the Leibniz notation, that's the d dx. So one would be d over dx, and the name of the function is g, so that would be called dg dx. The other one would be d dx, and then the name of the function is h of x. We're replacing the g with the h of x, but then pulling it outside of the d dx notation. Now notice that this is the derivative with respect to x. That's the way we would read this. So we're going to take the derivative of the h of x function with respect to the x variable. All right, this notation is very important. And also keep in mind that all of these notations refer to the derivative of a function and not the function itself. So in general, you would say my function is not the same as the derivative of my function. And you have to keep in mind that if you put equal signs between your lines, you're saying that they're equal. That's why we always make one statement on one line, and then under it we make a different statement. For example, we could make the statement h of x is equal to x squared, so h prime of x would be equal to 2x. Another way we could say this would be d dx of h of x is equal to 2x. I notice that the first line is not equivalent to the last two lines. And so you have to pay attention to the notation that you're saying and if you're putting equal signs between your statements. Now that we've got our notation down, let's go over the power rule. If you have x to a power, and you're differentiating with respect to x. Then you have x to a power 
then you have x to a power k. Well, then that k comes down as a coefficient, and we say k times x to the power of k minus 1. And so we're going to pull that power down in front and then reduce the power by 1. Let's see what that looks like over here. For our first example, it says taking the derivative with respect to x of x squared, we're going to pull that 2 down as a coefficient. We'll say x to the power of 1, but we don't have to write the 1. But 2 minus 1 would be a power of 1. The next one would be, oh, taking the ddx of x cubed, we're going to pull that coefficient from the power. The 3 comes down. We get x to the power of 2. Let's try it one more time. d dx of x to the fourth is 4 times x to the third. When you have integer powers, it's very easy to take that power down and subtract 1. Sometimes when we have negatives, we'll do the same thing. So we get d dx of x to the power negative 1. That becomes negative 1 x to the power of negative 2. However, this isn't the only way you might see this rule. You might see it in different notation. For example, d dx of 1 over x. This is the exact same question as the one above it because x to the power of negative 1 is the same thing as 1 over x. And our answer, when we translate that into fractions, becomes negative 1 over x squared. And so this here might look like we've never learned that rule. However, if we write these with exponents, we'll see that it means the same thing. All right, we now have d dx of x to the power of 1 half. When we pull that 1 half down in front, we get 1 half as my coefficient, x to the power of negative 1 half. All right, but what does a 1 half power mean? Recall that if you wrote this differently, this would be d dx of the square root of x, because the square root of x is x to the power of 1 half. And when I get this, this is 1 over 2, and x to the power of negative 1 half means that you have a radical down here. This rephrasing of the statement above is exactly the same thing, but writ written without powers. It's written with radicals instead of powers. So if you get a fraction or if you get a radical, just remember that you should write it with a power instead. Then you can apply the power rule and find the correct derivative. OK, let's get some practice. See if you can do the first example. Did you do it? Is this what you wrote? It's equal to 6x to the fifth. If that's what you wrote, that is not OK. So you recall that if this is my function, you can't say it's equal to the derivative. So you have to make sure that your notation is correct. That's the correct derivative, but you have to say it correctly. We would say d dx of x to the sixth is equal to 6x to the fifth. That's the proper way to write this. Alternatively, you could say y prime is equal to 6x to the fifth. And those are the two options you have right now. But you would not want to say that your original function is equal to its own derivative. So make sure you don't put equal signs there when they're not actually equal to each other. To do the next question, let's say d dx of our function x. And that is x to the power of 1. So we pull down the 1 power, and then we say x to the power of 0. But what is x to the power of 0? That's just 1. So we can erase this part and just say the derivative of x with respect to x is 1. Let's do the next question. It says d dx of x to the negative third, bringing down that exponent as a coefficient. And subtracting 1 gives us negative 4. If I wanted to rewrite this, it would be negative 3 over x to the positive 4. Now you don't have to. You could write it this way. 
And notice I can use equal signs in here because this is a rewriting of the exact same derivative. But I could not put an equal sign in between here because this derivative is not equal to my original function. Keep in mind that this power rule also allows us to differentiate expressions with rational exponents. And notice that this is a radical, but you can always rewrite the function to have a fraction in our exponent. And then, after I've written that the way, I can say the derivative of x to the power of 1 half is the same thing as 1 half x to the power of negative 1 half subtracting 1 from that original power. And I could rewrite this as 1 over 2 radical x. And the second example, it is giving us an exponent that is a decimal, and we can still do that. So I'm going to say d dx of x to the 0 0.4. Pulling that down gives me 0 0.4 as my coefficient x to the power of negative 0 0.6. And you just subtract 1 from whatever that coefficient is. And so that would be 0 0.4 over x to the power of 0 0.6. Now that doesn't really make it easier to look at to write in fraction form when it's a decimal, but it did make it easier to look at when we had a radical. So sometimes you might want to rewrite it and sometimes you might want to leave it as is. We're now looking at a new rule, that is, the rule about the derivative of a constant function. If you can imagine the graph of a constant function, it usually looks like a flat horizontal line with no slope, or a slope of zero. So when we find the derivative of a constant function, we say that the derivative is also zero. Let's go ahead and write these out. So d dx of 21 would be zero. Notice that the question says to differentiate with respect to x. x is supposed to be the variable in this, but there is no variable in this function. That's why it's a constant. Same thing here. y is equal to pi to the fourth. There is no x in this equation. So this is a constant. Even though it looks like a letter, it is a Greek letter, but it has a constant meaning, 3.14. So we would say d dx of pi to the fourth is 0. We now have another rule, that is the derivative of a constant function times a regular function. And notice that if you have the constant inside your derivative, you can pull it outside the derivative, and then you take the derivative of the function that's left over. Let's see what that's like. This question is asking us to find the derivative of 5 times x to the eighth. We can say that's the same thing as 5 times the derivative of x to the eighth which we know is 8x to the 7th. Notice that right here, I'm asking you to find the derivative of the regular function, and over here, I find the derivative, I lose the ddx notation. And then I can just multiply the 5 times that 8, and I get 40 times x to the 7th. Also notice that the 7 is a power on the x, but not a power on the 8. All right, let's try our next question. So it says d dx of negative 4x. The negative 4 is the constant, so we'll pull that out. And then we're going to say d dx of x. Now remember, that's x to the power of 1. So when you pull that down, then you get 1 times x to the power of 0, which is just 1. So now we just get the negative 4. Whenever you have an x to the power of 1, it sort of just disappears when we find that derivative. And so there we go, negative 4. Let's do this last one. It's a little bit difficult, so I'm going to rewrite it once. Well, more than once maybe. But I'm going to pull out the coefficient of 1 7th. And then we're going to find the derivative of 1 over x cubed. What does this mean? Well, it's 1 7th as my constant, and then I'm going to take the derivative d dx of x to the negative 3. Now let's try to find that derivative. So once again, keeping my constant on the outside, 
I'm going to bring down my negative 3 and then say now that's x to the power of negative 4 by subtracting 1 from that power. Let's rewrite this to make a little bit more sense. That's negative 3 over 7 and this x to the negative 4 will go into our denominator. Okay, let's look at our notation real quick. We took that coefficient of 1 7th outside of the derivative and we left the 1 over x to the power of 3 inside my derivative. I rewrote that as x to the power of negative 3 to take out my fractions and to make it as a power rule. We take down the power of negative 3 to multiply by the other coefficient. We subtract 1 from that power to make negative 4. And so then I get all of these pieces. This is in the numerator. This was in the denominator. And x to the negative 4 becomes x to the positive 4 in the denominator. All right, that's how you do this. We have a new rule about the derivatives of sums or differences. And basically, if you have the derivative of a phrase of multiple parts to it, you can take the derivative of each term and then add or subtract those terms together as applicable. So this ddx of 2x to the fifth plus 8 is the derivative of two terms. You can write it as the derivative of each term individually. And then we can apply the rules as we've been learning them. So ddx of 2x to the fifth is going to be 2 times the derivative of x to the fifth, which is 5x to the fourth. And then ddx of 8 is going to be 0. And then ddx of 8 is 0. So let's just simplify that. We would get 10x to the fourth plus 0. This next one has three terms, so we're just going to take ddx of each term, and let's go ahead and write that out, ddx of 12x, and let's write the other ones with, um, with exponents, so that we can use the exponent rule, and the power rule, x to the power of 1 half, and then taking the derivative of 3 times x to the power of negative 1. So if I take this and apply the power rule as we've been learning it, the derivative of 12x, that becomes 12 times 1. And then we say minus, we're going to get the 1 half x to the power of negative 1 half, and then this becomes plus, and then this becomes 3 times negative 1 times x to the power of negative 2. Let's take this and rewrite it. So 12 times 1 is 12. We get negative 1 over 2 radical x minus 3 over x squared. And so there's our derivative. There we go. 12 minus 1 over 2 times radical x minus 3 over x squared. For this word problem, we're given a function which describes distance. And it actually says it right here, her distance in terms of hours. And so our variable is t, which stands for hours, but the function in total finds a distance. So for the first question, when it says, find the distance that she's traveled at this, t equals 3 hours, all you have to do is plug in the value of 3 in for your t into the distance function. So I'm using my calculator to do that. So I type that function into my calculator, and then I use the table function to plug in 3 as my value, and then I get 133.95. And it's really important to be able to answer the correct number of units. So let's see, her distance is measured in miles. So let's say she traveled 133.95 miles. Now, if the question had specified, we might have to change that to 134 miles if we needed to round up to the closest mile. It doesn't specify, so I'm just going to leave it as is. 
But the second question says, find the instantaneous rate of change. And so whenever, whenever you see a question asking for the instantaneous rate of change, you have to remind yourself that that is synonymous with finding the derivative. And so we want to find the derivative of this. For b, we're going to find f prime of t. And so we're going to do that. Um, we'll get 1.85 times 3t squared, finding the derivative of that first function, and then minus 18.17, taking the derivative of the second term, gives me 2t, and then the derivative of the last one is 82.51 times the derivative of t, which is 1. Let's simplify this. So I would get 5.55t squared minus 36.34t plus 82.5. This is the derivative of my distance function. And that actually, the derivative of the distance function gives me her velocity. Now it does ask us, find the instantaneous rate of change, or her velocity, at t equals 3 hour. So we need to plug in 3 hours into our derivative. Notice it says f prime of 3 versus f of 3. And so that's the difference between question A and question B. And let's go ahead and use our calculator to find the solution. My calculator says 23.43. And so we have to ask ourselves, what did we just find the derivative of? We found her distance changing at this speed. And so this is the same thing as saying her um, d dt of the function. And so that'd be df dt, or her distance divided by time. And so this is how many miles she's going per hour. That's the unit of our distance, and that's a unit of our time. Let's write that a little bit better. She would have been going 23 miles, 0.43 miles per hour. Notice that the question for A was measured in miles, but the question for B was measured in miles per hour, because we have to think about the distance divided by the time. All right, we just have one more question to go. For this last question, we're talking about slopes of tangent lines. And if you were just to read this question without knowing what section it is in, um, it might not be evident to you that you have to find the derivative. But you have to remember that the slope of the tangent line is the same thing as finding the derivative at that point. So just like the last question, after we find the derivative, then we have to find the x value, or plug in an x value, or find when something happens at that x value. So the first thing we have to do is to take this function, we need to find the derivative. So let's just go ahead and say f prime of x, and this has two terms in it. We'll just take the derivative of each term individually, and so that would be 3x squared plus 3 times 2x to the power of 1. And let's rewrite that to be 3x squared plus 6x. This is the derivative. Now if I want to find where the tangent line is horizontal, that means that my slope would be 0 for it to be horizontal. So basically we want to say when is this value equal to 0. So for a, we're going to set that equal to 0. We're going to say when is the derivative equal to 0, that's when the slope is equal to 0. Let's solve this by factoring. I get 3x times x plus 2. So setting each of these equal to 0, I get at 0 itself, and at negative 2. At both of these times, you have 
the tangent line being horizontal. So let's write that in set notation. I would say at negative 2 and at 0, I have the slope being horizontal, or the tangent line is horizontal. Let's solve B. B asks us, when does the tangent line have a slope of 9? So we know that the derivatives gives us the equation for slope. We're going to set that equal to 9. Then we have to subtract 9 from both sides. And then I have to factor. It looks like I can divide everything by 3. So dividing gives me x squared plus 2x minus 3. And then factoring, that gives me x plus 3, x minus 1. Setting each of these to 0, I get negative 3 and positive 1. So at negative 3 and at positive 1, I have two solutions where my tangent line has a slope of 9. Let's just go over to Desmos really quick to see what that graph looks like. So we here is the graph x cubed plus 3x squared. We said that the slope was horizontal at negative 2 and at 0. So you can see the, slot, the lines that are horizontal at that point. And then we said that the slope was 9 at x equals 1 and at x equals negative 3. So I found those points here. If you can look at the point slope formula for the lines going through here, they are tangent to the graph, they each have a slope of 9, and they go through those points. So we found the correct values. So it looks like we have the correct answers for this question. So let's summarize the, what we learned in this section. We learned about different types of notation, writing y prime or f prime, and then writing dy dx or d dx of f of x. And then we learned about several different rules for differentiation, the power rule. We learned that the derivative of a constant is 0. And the derivative of a constant times a function, you just take the derivative of the function and multiply it by the constant. And then you can, you can take the derivative of something with multiple terms, and you take each term separately. So get some practice in and get familiar with the rules so that you can do this in any situation. Whether you have radicals or fractions, you want to write them as powers and apply the rules we learned today. Thank you and have a good day.